In August 1977, at the age of 42, the King proved that he was mortal. His death, as they say, was the end of an era. Elvis Presley's life was like a roller coaster, full of surprises and drama, from getting seven of his recordings in the Grammy Hall of Fame, Wouldn't make my dreams come true. to starring in almost 31 feature films in his lifetime. Elvis's life was anything but boring, but an addiction to Demerol and a number of record flops lead to the end of a remarkable era. But before we dive into the juicy details, let's take a step back and explore how this legendary pop star got his start. Early Life Elvis Aaron Presley was born on January 8, 1935, in Tupelo, Mississippi. He was born to Vernon and Gladys Love Presley, but his twin, Jesse Guerin, sadly didn't make it. Despite the loss, Elvis grew up close to both his parents, especially his mom. They were regulars at the local Assembly of God Church, where Elvis found his first taste of musical inspiration. Life wasn't always easy for the Presleys. Vernon jumped from one odd job to another, and the family often leaned on their neighbors and government food assistants to get by. Things took a turn in 1938 when they lost their home after Vernon landed in hot water for some tax fraud and ended up in jail for eight months. Come September 1941, Elvis kicked off his schooling at East Tupelo Consolidated. Teachers labeled him as an average child, but little did they know they had a future superstar in their midst. Fast forward to October 3, 1945, when 10-year-old Elvis made his debut at the Mississippi-Alabama Fair and Dairy Show. He belted out Old Shep and snagged fifth place, a solid start for a kid with big dreams. A few months later, Elvis got the best birthday gift ever, his first guitar. He got some pointers from his uncles and a pastor at church, but he was too shy to show off his skills in public. He had a terrible case of stage fright, but it wouldn't last long. In September 1946, Elvis switched things up and started sixth grade at Milam. The following year, he decided to break out his guitar skills at school, much to the amusement of his classmates, who labeled him as the trashy kid with a thing for hillbilly music. But Elvis was serious about his tunes. He was glued to Mississippi Slim's radio show and soaked up every chord technique Slim threw his way. When Slim finally gave Elvis his shot at fame with two on-air performances, stage fright got the best of him the first time around. But practice makes perfect, and Elvis came back stronger the following week. In November 1948, the Presley crew packed their bags and headed to Memphis, Tennessee. Elvis landed at L.C. Humes High School, where he scored a solid C in music during eighth grade. But when his music teacher shrugged off his singing skills, Elvis wasn't having it. He whipped out his guitar and belted out, Keep Them Cold Icy Fingers Off Me, a recent hit that shut up everyone who was doubting him in his school. Now Elvis wasn't exactly the class clown. He tended to keep to himself and got teased now and then for being a bit of a mama's boy. But in 1950, he decided to take his guitar game up a notch under the wing of Lee Denson, a neighbor with some serious musical chops. Together with a couple of buddies, including rockabilly sensations Dorsey and Johnny Burnett, they formed a little musical crew. By junior year, Elvis was starting to turn heads, not just because of his smooth moves, but also his slick style. He'd strut down Beale Street, soaking in the sights of Memphis's blues scene and admiring the flashy threads at Lansky Brothers. Come senior year, you couldn't miss him decked out in those same snazzy clothes. Elvis even got in on the action at Humes's annual minstrel show in 1953, singing Till I Waltz Again With You, a hit tune by Teresa Brewer. And let's just say, that performance did wonders for his reputation. He went from school underdog to the talk of the town overnight. He admitted later that he wasn't popular in school and actually failed music. But then they entered him into this talent show and when he came on stage, he heard people whispering in confusion because nobody knew he even sang. Presley had his own musical groove, and he decided that reading notes wasn't his jam. Instead, he played by ear, hitting up record shops with jukeboxes and listening booths. His playlist was stacked with tunes from Hank Snow and a bunch of other country crooners like Roy Acuff, Ernest Tubb, and Ted Daffin. But it wasn't just country that got his toes tapping. He had a thing for gospel too, 
especially thanks to Jake Hess, whose soulful style left a mark on him. When he wasn't spinning records, you could catch Elvis at the monthly all-night singings downtown, soaking in the sweet sounds of gospel groups. And let's not forget the radio. Stations like WDIA were blasting out race records, mixing up spirituals, blues, and rhythm and blues with that infectious backbeat. Some say he might have even snuck into blues joints on the nights when they were open to just the white crowd. But it wasn't all about the big names. Elvis had his ear to the ground, vibing with local African-American talents like Arthur Crudup and Rufus Thomas. And guess what? Even B.B. King, the blues legend himself, remembered rubbing elbows with Elvis back in the day, down on Beale Street. By the time he tossed his cap at graduation in June 1953, Elvis knew one thing for sure. Music was his calling. Background and early career. In August 1953, Presley made his way to Memphis Recording Service, run by Sam Phillips before he kicked off Sun Records. His plan was to lay down some tracks, specifically a double-sided acetate disc featuring songs like My Happiness and That's When Your Heartaches Begin. Now some say it was a birthday gift for his mom, while others reckon he just wanted to hear himself in action. Biographer Peter Goralnik leans towards the idea that Elvis was crossing his fingers for a lucky break at Sun. Then, in January 1954, he took another swing at it, recording, I'll never stand in your way, and it wouldn't be the same without you. But he got no feedback or buzz from it, and that wasn't the end of his near misses. He flubbed an audition for the Songfellows vocal quartet and tanked another one for Eddie Bond's band. Meanwhile, Phillips was hunting for someone who could bring the soulful sounds of Sun's black musicians to a wider audience. In June, he got his hands on a demo by Jimmy Sweeney, a tune called Without You that he thought might just be Elvis's ticket. So, he showed up at the studio, but he just couldn't nail the song, Without You, as hard as he tried. But Phillips wasn't ready to give up. He had Elvis try out some other tunes and was floored by what he heard. That's when he decided to pair him up with guitarist Winfield Scotty Moore and bassist Bill Black for a recording sesh. Now that session took place on July 5th and started off pretty rocky. They were about to call it quits when Elvis busted out with Arthur Crudup's That's All Right. And something just clicked for the crew. Moore, Black, and Elvis were grooving. And Phillips knew he had struck gold. He hit that record button, and the rest is history. So, three days later, DJ Dewey Phillips played That's All Right on his Red Hot and Blue show in Memphis and people went nuts for it. Dewey played that track on repeat for the next couple of hours. And when he had Elvis on the air, he had to clear up something for the public. Everyone thought Elvis was black because of the way he sounded. The trio, Elvis, Moore, and Black, decide to keep the momentum going and hit the studio to record Blue Moon of Kentucky in their signature style, complete with Sam Phillips's slapback echo effect. Then, on January 10, 1956, Elvis heads to Nashville to lay down some tracks for RCA Victor. He's got the usual crew, Moore, Black, Fontana, and pianist Floyd Kramer from his Hayride days. But RCA Victor spices things up, bringing in guitarist Chet Atkins and a few backup singers, including Gordon Stoker from the Jordanaires Quartet. They released Heartbreak Hotel, which dropped as a single on January 27th. Now this is where things start really heating up. Elvis was booked on CBS's stage show for six gigs over two months, thanks to his manager Colonel Tom Parker. The show's hosted by big band legends Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey, and after his first appearance on January 28th, Elvis stuck around NYC to hit up RCA Victor's studio. They bang out eight tunes, including a killer cover of Carl Perkins' Blue Suede Shoes. And in February, Elvis's I Forgot to Remember to Forget, a track he cut back in August 1955, topped the Billboard country chart. He parted ways with Neil, and Presley brought in Colonel Tom Parker to manage his career. Then, on March 23rd, RCA Victor drops Presley's debut album. It's a mix of sun recordings and freshly cut tracks with a little something for everyone. A couple of country tunes, a catchy pop number, and of course, the iconic blue suede shoes. Critics hailed it as a game changer, especially that cover of Blue Suede Shoes. Some said it even outdid Carl Perkins's original. But what really set Presley apart were his covers of R and B classics by Little Richard, Ray Charles, and the Drifters. He didn't just copy them, he put his own spin on them, 
making the guitar the star instead of the piano. The album shot straight to the top of the Billboard chart, holding on to that spot for a whopping 10 weeks. Even though he wasn't exactly shredding like Scotty Moore or other rockers of the time, Elvis's image on the cover, guitar in hand, living it up on stage, cemented the guitar's place as the default instrument of rock and roll. When I walk through the door. Musical style. According to music buffs, Elvis Presley was like the godfather of rockabilly. This whole rockabilly vibe really took off in 1954 when Elvis dropped his first record with Sun Records. It featured his raw vocals, a bluesy feel, and that signature twang from the country guitar. It's all there in That's All Right, the track that kicked off the rockabilly craze. Now, some people give Elvis all the credit for kickstarting rockabilly, but others like Carl Perkins argue it was a team effort with Sam Phillips, the man behind Sun Records, and let's not forget Bill Haley, who some say had the first big rockabilly hit. But Scotty Moore, Elvis's guitarist, said this style had been simmering for a while, with musicians like Carl Perkins and Jerry Lee Lewis already strumming up similar sounds. Once Elvis made the jump to RCA Victor, his rock and roll sound got even edgier. He used louder guitars and more group vocals, and brought a whole lot more intensity. But here's the thing, Elvis wasn't just about rockabilly. He was all over the map, from pop standards like Blue Moon to country ballads like How's the World Treating You. He even dabbled in blues with Santa Claus is Back in Town. And let's not forget his gospel side. His EP titled Peace in the Valley was a smash hit, becoming the top-selling gospel record ever and he kept sprinkling in gospel tunes throughout his career. After Elvis came back from his military stint in 1960, things in his music world took a bit of a turn. He was still rocking and rolling, but it was toned down a notch. His first post-army tune, Stuck on You, was a number one hit. RCA Victor called it a mild rock beat, but most people saw it as upbeat pop. Then there was She's Not You, released in 1962, where he blended in with the Jordan Airs, almost like doo-wop style. But for about six years, Elvis kinda drifted away from that bluesy R&B vibe he nailed in Elvis's back. Instead, he leaned into pop, especially ballads like Are You Lonesome Tonight? and It's Now or Never. But the 1968 comeback special cemented his place in the Pop Star Hall of Fame. The name says it all. Elvis was back with a bang belting out aggressive rock and roll tunes. But after that, straight-up rock songs were kinda scarce. He did have a hit with Burning Love, though, his last big pop smash. But Elvis didn't stick to one genre. He had a bit of pop, country, soul, and even funk. His style was constantly evolving, and by the 70s, Elvis was getting some love on country radio, circling back to where he started. But at the height of his fame, the public got to know of some dark secrets that the king had been hiding. I found a way to marry Elvis Presley and his two-way mirrors. A book released in 2014 called Elvis Presley, a Southern life by Joel Williamson really pulled back the curtain on the king's life. It delved into some pretty juicy details and revealed that Elvis had this thing for watching young women mud wrestling. He even went as far as installing a two-way mirror in one of the bathrooms in his mansion to spy on couples who came to his parties. According to Priscilla, his ex-wife, Elvis was a smooth operator when it came to wooing the ladies. He had this knack for making each woman feel like she was the center of his universe. Elvis's former bodyguard, Red West, spilled the tea on some wild parties where young girls were allegedly involved in some pretty questionable activities. Despite his reputation as an erotic exhibitionist on stage, it seems Elvis's bedroom skills were a bit overhyped. According to some of his former flames, the reality of sleeping with the star didn't quite live up to the legend. Plus, he had a weird obsession with the virginity of whoever he slept with. But hey, Elvis wasn't short on company. His inner circle claims he had a constant stream of women coming and going out of his door. Despite the mixed reviews about his performance in the bedroom, Elvis was certainly not lacking in female companionship. From models and actresses to beauty queens and singers, he had quite the roster of women in his life. But what's interesting is that among all these women, it was the virgins that Elvis seemed to value the most. The author of the biography talks about how there were even up to a dozen beautiful women who willingly gave up their virginity to him. Take Joyce Bova, for example. 
She later revealed that despite his fame, Elvis wasn't exactly a tiger in bed. Then there's Barbara Lee, a young starlet who had a brief fling with him. She admitted that while he was a great kisser and sweet, the actual deed didn't quite live up to the hype. And get this, she even blamed it on the drugs he was taking, saying it made it hard for him to be himself. It's kind of sad, really. Despite all the attention from adoring fans and even a marriage to Priscilla, Elvis always seemed to be searching for something more. Grooming Priscilla In her 1985 memoir, Elvis and Me, Priscilla opened up about her life with Elvis. She said he taught her everything from fashion to makeup to love, molding her into his ideal companion. She even described him as a mix of father, husband, and almost a god. But it wasn't all sunshine and roses. Elvis had some pretty strict rules. He wasn't keen on Priscilla pursuing a career in modeling or acting. Instead, he got her into karate, which he was really into. Little did he know that this would lead to Priscilla having an affair with her karate instructor, Mike Stone. She admitted that she still loved Elvis deeply, but knew she had some tough decisions to make about her future. Things came to a head when Elvis caught wind of the affair. He summoned Priscilla to his hotel room and forced her to end the relationship. It was moments like these that made people think of Elvis as toxic and controlling like he was grooming her. However, Priscilla doesn't believe this at all. At a press conference for a film about her life, she explained that their relationship wasn't some dark fairy tale. Despite their age difference, she emphasized that Elvis poured his heart out to her, and she was always there to listen and comfort him. In fact, she made it clear that they never even slept together when they met when she was just 14. Elvis, she said, was always gentle and respectful, even though their connection went beyond their years. Their relationship had its own set of quirks. Despite Elvis's emphasis on Priscilla's innocence, their romance stayed platonic. Though Elvis had many other flings on the side, from regular gals to Hollywood stars. But they found intimacy in other ways. One of their favorite pastimes was snapping Polaroids to capture playful moments, like role-playing scenarios straight out of a steamy novel. One of Elvis's favorites was that of playing teacher and student with Priscilla, but she often found herself holding down the fort at Graceland while Elvis jetted off to movie sets, earning her the nickname Live In Lolita. Elvis's manager, Colonel Tom Parker, was nervous about the situation and pushed for marriage to avoid any potential scandals. So, in the lead up to Christmas in 1966, Elvis popped the question. Despite feeling the weight of expectation, they tied the knot on May 1, 1967, in Las Vegas. Elvis was 32, and Priscilla was just shy of her 22nd birthday. Putting aside the accusations of grooming, it's clear that Elvis had his own quirks when it came to intimacy. He had this habit of speaking in baby talk with his mom, and apparently, even with his girlfriends. There's this story about Natalie Wood leaving a party after catching Elvis sitting on his mom's lap. And get this, Priscilla spilled the beans in 2021 that they also used to baby talk with each other. Turns out, that was just their thing. She said that she was always there at the door, ready to spoil him. She enjoyed taking care of Elvis and loved looking after him. They'd chat away in their own special language because they needed their own lingo, as they were surrounded by so many people all the time. Even after their divorce in 1973, they remained tight. Elvis still meant the world to her. They had grown into good friends over the years, owning up to their past blunders and starting to laugh at their flaws. At that point, she couldn't fathom the idea of never seeing him again. He'd always been her rock, but towards the end of their marriage, things got rocky. What stung Priscilla the most was that he didn't understand her as a woman, and by the time he tried to make amends, it was too late. Her physical and emotional needs had been neglected, and he didn't feel like the same understanding guy she had fallen for. The Secret Autopsy August 16, 1977 was the day the music died a little. Elvis Presley, the heartthrob with the voice of an angel, and those iconic blue suede shoes met his untimely end at the age of 43. No grand finale, just a quiet exit. He was discovered face down on the bathroom floor of his beloved Graceland estate, not far from the toilet. The circumstances of his passing have been hashed and rehashed over the years, but the details of his autopsy have remained under wraps for nearly five decades. In the years leading up to his tragic demise, Elvis was battling demons of his own. His once-fit physique took a hit from years of drug use and a diet that consisted mainly of junk food. The same guy who used to charm audiences with his moves on stage ballooned to a whopping 25 stone. 
He practically lived on cheeseburgers, holed up in his bedroom for months on end. His health was so fragile that he needed round-the-clock care, and rumor has it he skipped bathing for an entire year, leaving him with sores all over his body. As if that wasn't enough, the king suffered from chronic constipation, a not-so-fun side effect of his high-fat diet. A post-mortem examination revealed he had a four-month-old blockage in his bowels. But that wasn't the only thing weighing him down. Elvis was hooked on a cocktail of drugs, with a laundry list of prescriptions totaling a whopping 9,000 pills, vials, and injections in the months leading up to his passing. It was his girlfriend, Ginger Alden, who stumbled upon the heartbreaking scene. She walked in to find Elvis lying lifeless, his pajama bottoms around his ankles, and his arms stretched out by his side. She was just 21 at the time, and the sight haunts her to this day. Ginger gently turned his face towards her and noticed a faint breath escaping his nose. His tongue was caught between his teeth and his complexion was splotchy. She dared to lift his eyelid, only to find his eye staring vacantly ahead, bloodshot. The autopsy was conducted as soon as possible, but the findings were kept under wraps for a half century by the Presley family, fueling endless speculation about the cause of his demise. Dan Warlick, who was present at the autopsy, suggested that Elvis may have suffered from chronic constipation, a result of years of prescription drug use and unhealthy eating habits. The strain of trying to relieve himself might have triggered a heart-stopping event. Others speculated that drugs played a role, but when the case was revisited in 1994, coroner Joseph Davis disagreed. He reasoned that Elvis was in the act of sitting on the toilet when the fatal seizure struck. If drugs were the culprit, Davis argued, Elvis would have slipped into a drowsy state and likely sought help. Instead, he met his end swiftly, leaving behind a legacy shrouded in mystery. The autopsy results are set to be revealed in 2027, offering a peek into the enigma surrounding Elvis's death. But until then, a significant glimpse into the puzzle came from Forrest Tennant, a well-known California doctor. He delved into the autopsy report while defending Elvis's physician, Dr. George Nicopolis, who faced accusations of overprescribing medications but was ultimately acquitted. Tennant observed a stark deterioration in Elvis's overall health, with nearly every organ showing signs of distress. Despite his youthful athleticism, Elvis's health took a nosedive likely made worse by his history of drug abuse and unhealthy eating habits. But Tennant found it insufficient to explain the laundry list of ailments plaguing the rock legend from the late 1960s and onward. Elvis's health complaints piled up over the years, ranging from vertigo and back pain to jaundice and respiratory distress. He battled conditions like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and megacolon, a condition causing the large intestine to become distended. Shockingly, he endured several near-fatal overdoses, leading to unconsciousness and requiring resuscitation. Even though he never smoked, Elvis was diagnosed with emphysema. Tennant believed that a serious head injury at 1967 may have triggered an autoimmune disorder, setting off a cascade of health issues affecting his stomach, liver, lungs, heart, spine, eyes, and bowel. This theory sheds new light on the health struggles Elvis faced in his final years, adding another layer of complexity to his untimely demise. But a 2013 medical paper revealed that Elvis took a nasty spill over a TV cord, smacking his head on the bathtub. Well, turns out it was worse than we thought. The blow was so intense that it jostled some brain tissue loose, letting it wander into his bloodstream. Now, his body didn't take kindly to these unexpected travelers, so it launched a full-scale immune attack, leading to a condition called hypogamma globulinemia. Back then, folks didn't know much about autoimmune stuff, but these days, we've got a better handle on it. Turns out, it could explain a lot of Elvis's health issues. Chronic pain, odd behavior, and those telltale signs like his weight gain and those enlarged organs. Gary Rogers, a former detective and coroner, told the Huffington Post in 2016 that if you connect the dots, Elvis's passing could be chalked up to a combo of heart troubles, drug use, and the fallout from that brain injury. Elvis's doctor, Dr. Nicopolis, had a heavy prescription pad. I mean, he had taken an insane amount of pills in just eight months. No wonder his medical license took a hit. But was he to blame for Elvis's demise? Well, it seems like it's more complicated than that. There wasn't much clarity back then on what was really going on with the king's health. 
Elvis's death hit his fans hard. Nobody believed that he'd go so soon, especially since he kinda expected to live as long as his mom did. She passed away in her 40s. But life can throw some curveballs, even for the king of rock and roll. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.